just go start with like, hi, Adam. Well, don't, don't you want to start with welcome to uncertain things? Oh, you things. want me to do that? Okay. I don't know. I mean, I, I still think we should start with a, you and I saying hello. So. Okay. Hey, Adam. Hey, Vanessa. So this week we have someone near and dear to your heart and mind, Mr. Tom Holland. Yes, Tom Holland, the historian, not Spider-Man. <laughs> Tom is one of those few historians who is really well known. Now, primarily, he's known as the guy who started my infatuation with Roman history. Secondly, he's known for Rubicon, which is his uh, book about the Roman Republic. It's award-winning, best-selling, reads like a freaking thriller, which isn't surprising considering that Tom started his career writing uh, Penny Dreadfuls. There was like an alternate history of Lord Byron as a vampire or something in one of his early novels. And, you know, I wish we could have brought it up. Right. And and you do mention it in passing. But here's the twist. Aside from being a great writer, he's also an extremely rigorous historian. In his work, Tom takes a deep look into how the stories that a society tells itself end up shaping its destiny. And he's done it with the Romans, with the Persian Empire, with the Muslim empires. And now, in his latest book, Dominion, he's doing it with the Christian West. In a way, this is the last chapter of a conversation that we started with Tomer Persico on our first episode. If you have all the time in the world, which, you know, who doesn't, uh, go ahead and listen to that first. And that should give you the, you know, all the pretext that you need for this conversation. But if you're lazy, the argument is basically that every intellectual compass that we use today to measure ourselves or to judge what is good and what is bad has its bearings set according to Christian sentiment. Christianity is the North. And this is a wonderfully provocative argument, which can be very unsettling to people who are, say, not Christian, like myself. That said, I, I, I think he does, he does make some compelling arguments this idea of, for example, human rights, like there, there is no, you know, universal truth that every human has a right to X, Y, Z. Um, and he kind of makes this parallel that, you know, that is that that sense of belief that we all have human rights. That's actually a, a descendant of a, of a Christian way of thinking. So that's the kind of stuff that he's talking about here. It's the how the, the very framework of our mind, even if we don't espouse Christian uh, beliefs anymore. Those Christian values have snuck in a bit. Right. And and Tom also has this incredible talent to zip across time as if he were Doctor Who, jumping from the Roman Republic to the Black Lives Matter and Me Too movements, all within the span of a single sentence. So <laughs> we're, we're just going to let him show you the magic. For your listening pleasure, our conversation with Tom Hall. So Tom, thank you, thank you for joining us and and in our attempt to bring some some joy to the people. Well, um, I'm <laughs> I'm very honoured to be asked, and I will do my best to bring some joy. <laughs> but I may not. No easy task. So the first time I came across your writing was in my first summer vacation as an undergraduate in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, studying history, and. I remember at that time, I, for, I, I was really into history. It's just that I defined history as starting around the 1500s. So I had very little interest in antiquity. But then I, I read your book. And for the first time, it was like I was seeing those characters, those characters that you think you know, like Caesar, or Cicero, that you've seen adapted in many um, novels and plays. But suddenly for your book... It was like, for the first time, I, I was actually seeing the world through their eyes, on their terms, seeing how different and foreign it is. This is actually new news to me, Tom, and I know Adam very well. But I didn't realize that it began with, with Rubicon, because as far as I've known Adam, he's been a, an antiquities nut, as far as I knew. So this is, this is really great oh, to hear. In that, in that case, I'm, I'm, I'm very I'm, I'm thrilled that it had that effect and... Uh opened um set you on the course of fascination with antiquity which um you know I, i've had since i was about seven i'll be honest um so uh, I, I i've always had it 
Um, but I'm always, you know, thrilled to spread the news. Uh, how 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 did it start with you? Well, I was I was one of those kind of little boys who was obsessed by dinosaurs, uh, and when I look back at it, I realised that that um, what fascinated me about dinosaurs was was basically that. Um, they were incredibly exotic and thrilling and fierce and frightening and glamorous, um, and they'd actually existed. So I was much more interested in them than, than dragons or monsters <laughs> like that, that hadn't existed. Um, and basically, my interest in um, Rome in particular was a kind of seamless evolution, because Rome is really the kind of the Tyrannosaur of antiquity. It's the apex predator. Um, and again, like dinosaurs, it's kind of glamorous, fierce, and and extinct it, it's no longer around and i think it's that kind of um th- the incredible immediacy we have so many sources for it there are so many physical remains um to that extent we know so much about it and yet we're separated from such a chasm by such a chasm of time it's completely gone and actually the fascination is that the, that, that, that even as you feel you know it you know that you don't know it and really that's been the kind of um the balance that uh, I've been aware of throughout my whole life, and it's the kind of fascination that that you know evolves with you as you as you move through time. And I think also, I mean, you mentioned Rubicon, so I I, I began that um, in uh, around the year two thousand, so around the time of the millennium, and there, there was plenty about it that that um, I thought you know because I'm tell from my accent I'm um, English. The Romans invaded Britain, Julius Caesar invaded Britain, uh, they, they, they were active in Gaul, to put it mildly. Um, so I knew that, that there was a kind of hook there. But what I was more worried about was would people be interested in the engagement of the Roman Republic, this great imperial republic, in the affairs of the Middle East? And I thought, well, I don't know, will people be interested in that? And then as I was writing it, 9-11 happened and the build-up to the, uh, the Second Iraq War, and suddenly everyone was saying, wow, you know, the parallels are amazing. So Rubicon came out just as um, the sense that um, Bush's America was a new Rome became part of the the kind of the public dialogue. And what that really brought home to me was that um, the temptation to find parallels with ancient Rome is absolutely irresistible. And I think it's irresistible for everybody in, in what we might call the West, so in Europe as well as in America. But I think it's particularly irresistible for Americans because the American Republic was very self-consciously founded on the model of ancient Rome. And so although the differences are enormous, there are those kind of parallels that are implicit in the fact that in America you have a Senate, uh, you have a Capitol, uh, you have buildings with loads of columns. And so whenever... Um, you have a Cincinnati. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, so, and so whenever um, some dramatic event happens in American history, and they seem to be happening all the time, the temptation is to say, well, what's the parallel with ancient Rome? So, I, I mean, I, I would say, I mean, if I, the number of times that people say, well, what Roman emperor is, should we compare Trump to? Um, I'd be an incredibly rich man if I had a dollar for every time that happened. Um, it's it's just irresistible. So I think that, that that Rome, in particular, of all the ancient civilizations, has that kind of weird science fiction quality that it seems very familiar and very strange. And the more familiar it is, and the, the more strange it becomes, and vice versa. And and I think that that's part of the appeal. It, it's 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 funny that you say that because I marked uh, to myself a line from your intro to Rubicon that I always very much loved. I think that's part of what set me. On the on the new mindset of being able to appreciate antiquity a little bit, and and pardon me for quoting you to you, but um, here goes: <clears throat> If there is much about Rome we can never know, then still there is much that can be brought back to life. Its citizens, half emerging from antique marble, their faces illuminated by a background of gold and fire, the glare of an alien yet sometimes eerily familiar world. There's such an insight in this about not just Rome, but history in general, that balance, that, that it's tempting to see them as reflections of ourselves, and it's valuable to see them as such, but also they're not. They don't understand the world the way we do. 
Yeah, and, and it's interesting you pick on that because of two things about that. The first is that that when I wrote that, I was thinking about um, a, a Mantegna painting that's in the National Gallery here in London. I don't, don't know if you know it, and it, it shows um, the, the the coming of of Kibale to Rome. And Mantegna, I think, in the fifteenth century, is it is is painting it as a frieze. So it's a painting, but it looks like a frieze, and he's clearly modelled it on Roman friezes that he studied. So I realise now that even it, when I was writing that, that that sense, it was kind of mediated through the Renaissance. So that that's kind of part of the problem is that so many people before you have written about Rome that it's very difficult actually to kind of completely have clear eyes yourself. You're always looking, you're always aware of other people's interpretations before you. But the other thing is that um, over the course of the the almost two decades now since I I, I wrote Rubicon, um, my sense of of just how different the Romans are. And and you know, perforce, other ancient civilizations, perhaps even more so, has just grown and grown and grown. And um, as I was, uh, you know, as I was writing Rubicon, as I've gone on to write other uh, books, the realization that there are all kinds of words um, that we use in English that are just so freighted with assumptions that would have meant nothing to the Romans. So words like religion. Um, homosexuality, uh, secular, um, that English itself, in a way, is a kind of smokescreen that, that, that prevents you from seeing or writing about the Romans clearly. And increasingly, I've come to the conclusion that the problem, in terms of getting back to, to, to seeing the world in, the, in, in you know, the classical world, is that, that the Western world has been, ha, has been so affected by one thing in particular, which is the emergence of Christianity and the evolution of Christianity over, over the course of 2,000 years, that even if you're not a believing Christian, even if, if, even if you are from another faith tradition, if you use a Western language like English, the risk is that you are so saturated in Christian assumptions that you don't even realise it. So my most recent book, Dominion, that's, that's been the theme of that is a kind of exploration of what it is about Christianity that makes it so difficult to get back to an understanding of, of, of what the pre-Christian world was. Before we dive into Dominion, um, which we're definitely going to do, I just I want to just linger one more second about what you said about English being a smokescreen. And I think it's interesting, not only with words that would not have made any sense to the Romans, like you said, homosexuality and religion, but words that we share, like liberty, which would have meant yeah. completely different ideas back then. Yeah, and, and um, I mean, the same goes for Greeks, so I'm thinking of democracy. I think there's a kind of temptation to think of, of, of democracy in terms of the, um, the systems of government that we live under, to, to think that Athenian democracy has value because it's a precursor for our models of democracy, rather than trying to think of it in its own terms. Because the effort of, of trying to think yourself into the mindset of an Athenian is so difficult. And I think a crucial part of it is that, in a way, the very, the very standards of investigation that are required by a historian today, at least by today's understanding of what a historian should be doing, in a way are antithetical to getting into the mindset say, of an ancient Athenian, because we don't believe in the Athenian gods. Uh, and we find it almost impossible to imagine that, that to an Athenian, you know, Athe Athena, the inheritance of the ancient past as, they, as the Athenians understood it, is, is an absolutely necessary precondition for understanding what it was that the Athenians thought their system of government was. Whereas we kind of abstract it, we think of democracy as something that is an abstraction. But that wasn't what it was at all to the Athenians. It, for the Athenians, it was completely rooted in mythological frameworks, understandings of the, of, of the way that the universe functioned and the role that humans had within that, 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 that we find impossible to engage with at all. Because, and in, and, and in a sense, the difficulty is, is that the very effort of, of trying to think yourself into the mindset of an, of an Athenian requires you to let slip the approach to history that is kind of required of, of someone today in the 21st century in the West writing about history. And this is something I've been really grappling with at the moment, 
because my current project is um, a children's history of ancient Greece. And in a way, it's the, the, the exciting thing for me in writing it is that um, because it's for children, um, I, I can... I can treat what would seem fantastical to an adult completely literally. So I can write about the gods as though they exist. Um, I can write about Athena as though she really is, a, 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 you know, a present active participant, as though the, um, the explanations that the Greeks give for things, the, the kind of the bloodlines that they trace back to, you know, the various rapes of Zeus or whatever. And you can imagine it's quite difficult putting that into words that, that are acceptable for a children's book. But, but it kind of, it, and, and it, gives to, then it gives to history a kind of thrilling, I hope, thrilling quality of fantasy. Mm. Uh, and yet I think that that quality of fantasy, in a way, is truer to the lived experience of people in the fifth century, perhaps, than a kind of cool, objective, analytical study of um, Greek democracy of the kind that you would get in an academic work, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, I should I should say to people who haven't read your books yet um, and are considering buying them, A, that you absolutely should, and B, that this is your, I'd say, method in, in I think, all of your writing, get, just telling the story through the perspective of those characters to some extent, almost taking, yeah. trying to take for granted their assumptions about, about the world, about nature, about the gods. And, yeah. and I, was, I was also struck too, as I was uh, research, researching into your background a bit, uh, Tom, about the fact that you actually started off writing novels, which I think speaks very uh, strongly to this kind of approach to writing history, which is about getting into the mindset of how people felt and and experience their world and as a kind of prerequisite for explaining the history and the context. Well, my, my um, academic background is in literature rather than in history, mm. um, which some might consider um, a drawback, but, <laughs> but I don't because um, the periods that I write about and the things that interest me, I think that the, the literary quality of the source material is absolutely crucial. So if you look at um, antiquity in particular, what we call the primary sources are not what today we'd call a primary source. So Herodotus or Tacitus say are highly literary uh, projects. Um, they've already shaped our understanding of it. Um, and so you have this kind of tension in, in, in say, in, in when you, you look at Herodotus, the first great historian, um, how, do you, how, how do you handle this? Is this a work of literature to be subjected to literary criticism? Or is it a kind of great quarry full of facts that have to be carefully sifted and evaluated before you can use it to write history? But I think that um, ultimately the, the ambition has to be to try and make, to, to acknowledge both, that um, in a sense there is no prospect of making sense of the ancient past unless you acknowledge the the inherently literary and by extension fantastical quality of the source material um, and absolutely if you can in some way embed a perspective that enables the reader to share in your protagonist's understanding say of the gods or uh, the miraculous or whatever then I think that that, that is an, a justifiable approach. So um, that's pretty much why uh, I, I, I try and write history, I guess, that is, that is literature as much as it is history. And I think that history is the only academic discipline that is also a branch of literature. Um, and, and I think that there's, there's so much scope for kind of exploration there. And I guess that that's also why I've become increasingly interested in the way that um, what we call religion, although we may come on to why I think that's a very problematic word, but the way that um, the stories that structure uh, the way that Jews or Christians or Muslims understand the world are fundamental to the way that Jewish or Christian or Muslim history has rolled out, because those stories are, in a sense, absolutely preconditions for for how they see the world. So looking at the moment, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, 
um, w- w- what is it that underpins that? Because actually, it's quite odd the idea that um, the oppressed, those who, who who historically have been trampled down, who have not been um, the leaders in a society, should um, should in a sense not just have the right to improve their lot, but that they should be able to call upon their oppressors to understand what the problem is. So. You know, you look at the um, Black Lives Matters protests. Loads and loads of protesters are are, are white. What, so, what is it that, that is that that explains that? It doesn't seem self evident at all. And I think that that when you look at the the, the historical roots of Black Lives Matter, it lies in um, the civil rights movement. And a crucial framework for the civil rights movement, the impact that it had, was that Martin Luther King, the Reverend Martin Luther King, was able to draw analogies between. Um, his campaign and Exodus, the idea that God's chosen people were slaves and that God achieved miraculous things and set those slaves free and brought them into a promised land. And that, of course, is is a, a narrative that has a particular resonance for black Americans because they are themselves the descendants of slaves. But it also has a resonance for um, white Christians in America, because they too are heirs to those stories. And the idea of an exodus um, leaving behind um, Egypt and going to a promised land, in a way, is kind of the foundational myth for for white America as well. Um, And so that story, the exodus story, is, you know, it's not just kind of a background. It's something that has shaped the way that Americans understand their history and therefore has shaped that history itself. And I think that that's completely fascinating because it demonstrates that um, stories in the Bible, uh, stories that Muslims say tell about the life of Muhammad, that these are not just background. These are things that, that actively influence the course of events. They are capable of shaking society reforming society, recalibrating society. And I think that that although the Black Lives Matter protests are, are, are not overtly um, Christian, uh, indeed often are, are quite antithetical to um, the, the churches, nevertheless, it's pretty clear where these narratives ultimately are, are deriving their power from. Because as I say, the reason that we uh, in the West have an identification with slaves rather than with masters ultimately goes back to exodus goes back to a story i wonder adam if we should take a step back and and maybe context set a little bit for someone who may have not read the book yet and may not yet understand how clearly there is a a connection between this kind of slave master relationship and how that theme has infiltrated almost every element of our society and i wonder if we should just if you wouldn't mind unpacking that well, as, as I said, I, I, I became interested in, in, um, in first of all, how, it, 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 how Islam, I wrote, wrote a book about the, the, the coming of Islam in the, um, the eastern half of the Mediterranean um, and tried to write about it as the collapse of, of the Roman Empire in the East. And that was at a time when um, the Arab Spring was happening and the emergence of ISIS, um, and it was evident that... Um, stories that Muslims told about the origins of their faith were massively seismic in their implications. And again, that this wasn't just kind of background. Um, But also, writing about the Romans, writing about the the, the Greeks, it became very clear to me that these these were, in a way, very alien and frightening people. And I I compared the Romans to a tyrannosaur. Uh, You know, I mean, tyrannosaurs are fascinating, but you wouldn't want one as a pet. And again and again, when I was writing about the Romans, I would think, well, what is it that has changed? Um, and talked about how, in, you know, the Romans seem familiar to us. They um, they have heated swimming pools and they have property contracts and, you know, they, Cicero worries about um, cracks in the, the, the walls of his second home and things like this. And it seems so familiar, in a way much more familiar than, than say, the, the European Middle Ages. But... Again and again, you're brought up short against aspects of Roman society that just seem incredibly brutal. And I suppose one of them, one of those aspects is is something that people might be tempted to think is is kind of constant and universal, which is um, attitudes to sex. 
you might think that that sexual feelings are have been so constant you know it's something every human being feels that they must be kind of a, a constant throughout so people talk about you know homosexuality is something a, a concept that has existed forever it's just kind of there but but I, there is no presence of a concept called homosexuality in in Rome um, you know, the word itself is like television. It's kind of a fusion of, of, of Greek and Latin. And it's just as almost as novel. It's, it's only coined in the 19th century. Um, and instead, when you look at, at, at Roman writings about sex, Roman love poetry, um, the physical evidence for it, the kind of incredible array of fallacies that um, are just kind of everywhere in, in, in museums of the Roman antiquities, um, you realize it's a really different world and, and, and to understand it, you have to set aside everything that you think you know about how sex operates. And you have to appreciate that for the Romans, really, the, 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 the binary, you know, it's not homosexual or heterosexual. It's um, do you have power or do you not have power? And the, the person who has power in Rome is the free male citizen. And essentially, he can do anything he like he likes to anyone who is his subordinate. Um, he can use them any way that he wants. So it's an incredibly brutal world. What is it that changes? What is it that persuades powerful men that they cannot just use the bodies of their inferiors as the kind of equivalent of urinals, to, uh, as, as, as receptacles for their bodily fluid? And Again, I think that, that it is the long, slow, gradual weathering process of Christianity that serves to change it. And the kind of very weird doctrines that you get, first of all, in Paul's letters. I mean, they're weird seen from the perspective of, of a Roman. This kind of strange melange of, 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 of kind of weird Jewish doctrines that have, have kind of mutated into a peculiar, into a peculiar form. And from these, these you, you, you get over the course of the centuries that follow, um, and particularly increasing once Constantine converts to Christianity, it's like a kind of acid eating away at everything that the Romans had taken for granted about, about the way that sex should operate, the way that... Um, human beings should relate to each other sexually, the way that human bodies should be regarded. And we live with the consequence of that transformation to this day. And again, you know, talked about Black Lives Matter, but the other obvious parallel would be Me Too, because the big question about Me Too that, that no one even really thinks to ask is, well, what's so wrong with um, a powerful man like Harvey Weinstein or whoever um, sexually abusing his inferiors? A Roman would completely have taken it for granted. And the fascinating thing about Me Too isn't that, that women rallied to it. It's basically that men rallied to it and accepted the justice of what was being said. Um, why? <laughs> Such an interesting question when you come at it from the perspective of the way that the Romans understood, or at least Roman men understood how sex, um, what, what sex was about. And to be clear you're not you're not suggesting that the answer is the um the holy ghost landed on <laughs> onto europe and 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 guided us into a more enlightened future you're you're describing a gradual material change and intellectual change that has led to that and and your book yeah. does that very painstakingly going through the stages as those ideas developed and 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 their consequences and their consequences are by no means all positive or or enlightened but but, but the, yeah so, so, so that's exactly the point so when we say um say you know does the coming of christianity is it good or bad thing what's the definition of good or bad um by and large Christianity creates the standards of good and bad by which it is itself judged in Western societies. Um, so, uh, say, people always bring up the Inquisition. Um, so, you know, what's wrong with um, a, 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 a powerful state um, torturing someone innocent to death? Uh, well, you know, the central symbol of Christianity is an innocent man being tortured to death by the state apparatus. So in a sense, the Inquisition is being condemned for highly Christian reasons. 
And again, the, the idea that, that, you know, is this enlightened? So that's kind of harking back to something called the enlightenment, which um, by and large people who reject Christianity or uh, a belief in God uh, tend to be very keen on and imagine that it's an emancipation from uh, Christian assumptions. And I have to say that I, I completely thought that myself. But when you think about what is going on in the enlightenment, I mean, what, what, what tease out what enlightenment means? It means the bringing of people who walked in darkness into light. It means the toppling of idols. It means the banishing of superstition. And when you put it in those terms, it's not very hard to see that there's a direct line of descent there from the Protestant Reformation, which speaks completely in those terms. And of course, has as its object of scorn, not Christianity per se, but the Roman church. But then you push it back further and you think the Roman church um, you know, is the medieval church, the missionaries that, 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 that laid the foundations of that in early medieval Europe. Again, they saw themselves as bringing light to the dripping dank forests of pagan Saxony. Uh, they were chopping down the idols of uh, the worshippers of Thor. They saw themselves as banishing superstition. And those Christian missionaries in turn were drawing on, on the much more venerable inheritance of the Hebrew prophets who completely spoke in these terms. Um, you know, it's Isaiah who talks about bringing people who walk in darkness into light. Uh, it's the Hebrew prophets who talk about how the, the, the idols of, of Babylon or Egypt or Assyria are just stock and stone. It's, it's, um, it's the Hebrew prophets who uh, condemn the worship of these idols as superstition. So to that extent, what we call the Enlightenment and this sense that um, you know, superstition is it, it, something called superstition exists. It's bad. We have to to, to get ri get rid of it. We have to to enlighten people. That's an inheritance of Christianity, and in turn, an inheritance of the uh, of, of 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 the Hebrew scriptures. So, going back to your own point about Black Lives Matter and Me Too, and even going back to the, our previous podcast, wokeness itself is a product of Christianity. Pretty, pretty clearly. I mean, I think that that's the, the, the phrase, you know, the great awakening is, is hearkening back to the tradition of great awakenings that characterize Anglo-American Protestantism um, that, 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 that has, has you know, again and again, uh, the feeling that um, society is steeped in sin, that there has to be repentance, um, and it generates a kind of great upsurge of, of, of moral fervor, a condemnation of sin and of sinners. Um, I, th I think that, that, that the roots of it are, are, you know, this is like a kind of um, ripple effect of um, earthquakes, you know, aftershocks yeah. spilling out and out and out and out. I think, of course, it is different because unlike um, the previous great manifestation of this in, in the 50s and 60s with the civil rights movement, which was very overtly Christian, this, this, this is not. And so um, I think one of, the, one of the aspects of it that is, um, I suppose there are two aspects. One is uh, th th that is a repudiation of Christianity as it's conventionally been understood. One is the idea that we are all sinners. So the idea of original sin, that's something that people in the 60s really found repulsive and, and, and turned against. The idea that, 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 that kind of Western Christianity is inherited from Augustine, this idea that because Adam and Eve fell, therefore we are all saturated in, in the consequences of that fall, that we all have sin. But conversely, I mean, looking at it in a different way, there's something very democratic about that, actually, because if we're all sinners, then none of us can be completely virtuous. Augustine's doctrine evolved in the context of, um, actually, it's the very first British intellectual, a guy called Pelagius, um, who argued that, that perfection was possible for human beings, that we could become perfect. Um, and actually, w when you look at um, wokeness, I, I, I feel that that's quite, actually quite oppressive because it means that if you don't make yourself perfect, then you're at fault. Whereas if we, we are, in fact, all sinners, then in a sense, I mean, you do your best but you're never going to become perfect. And there is a kind of strain in um, kind of the extreme wokeness 
that does imply that perfection is possible and that those who are promoting it have attained it. And I think the other thing is that um, the, um, the, 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 the great um, kind of moral core of Christianity, again, going right the way back to Paul, is that there is no Jew or Greek, that all are one. Uh, all are created equally. So therefore, if there's no dual Greek, there's no black or white. And that was the message that um, the uh, that Martin Luther King absolutely uh, preached. It was a summons to white American Christians, not that they were kind of saturated in whiteness and therefore, uh, because they were white, therefore they were inherently sinners. It was a reminder to white Americans that they, um, you know, that, that, that black Christians were their brothers and sisters. Um, and I think that that is something that has kind of slipped. I think that, that and, and the paradox is, I think, that as a result, Black Lives Matter movement has actually racialized it, um, the, the campaign, in a way that the civil rights movement didn't. May, may I ask, why does it matter to recognize the Christian inheritance? What, I mean, what is there to be gained by recognizing this kind of origin story uh and 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 ask that in the broad sense but also maybe for you personally as you look at history what has it what has this prism kind of meant for you as well Well, i i I, my book in the shadow of the sword which was about the, the emergence of islam was uh quite controversial because um i i wanted to try and understand the the origins of islam in 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 terms that i could you know, I'm not a Muslim, so I don't think that um, God, through Gabriel, spoke to Muhammad. Um, so therefore, I wanted an explanation for the emergence of Islam that would make sense to me as someone who didn't believe that, who didn't believe that there'd been a supernatural intervention. Um, and uh, essentially, I kind of ended up arguing, and it's certainly not original to me, I'm drawing on, on much, you know, scholars who, much greater scholars than me, but essentially, I ended up arguing that the stories told and believed in by Muslims about the beginnings of their uh, about, about the beginnings of Islam were back projections that were written centuries after the events that they described, um, and that the likely explanation for the emergence of Islam was rather different. I remember um, talking about this to uh, an audience of Muslims, and one of them saying, "You know, well, I see why you've done this, but but you would never do this to your beliefs, to your values." Uh, you know, you 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 are here as someone who doesn't believe in God. You would never question where you where, where your belief that God doesn't exist comes from. And it was the single most pointed and justified criticism that I'd had. So I became interested in 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 a way in 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 judging everything that I thought and and took for granted. And asking, well, where does it come from? Why do I think the way that I, I think? And kind of a bit like following a, you know, a thread through a labyrinth, that's when I began to really, really wake up to the fact that my kind of lazy assumption that there, was, there, you know, there had been an enlightenment and the light switch had gone on simply couldn't be true. It was as much a myth as, the, you know, it was a virgin birth, the idea that it you know, just come from nowhere. Um, can, so, you, can you can you just uh, um, elaborate a little bit about your assumptions about what what was your cosmological view at least when you were starting to work on Dominion? Well, I, so I was I was raised uh, in the Church of England, um, but I, my belief in God kind of faded like a dimmer switch being lowered. Uh, partly partly because I found the Greek gods much much sexier and more fun and more charismatic um partly because of dinosaurs so kind of very victorian <laughs> crisis of faith. you know i dinosaurs and greek gods yeah i i in dominion i described as kind of what i went to sunday school and there was a an illustrated bible and adam and eve were in in the garden of eden with a brachiosaur and i just thought don't think that happened <laughs> well well, well it, it 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 kind of drained my belief in the supernatural uh, and specifically in in, um, in in Christianity, but in a way, I didn't. I didn't kind of. Um, I, I suppose I didn't miss Christianity or or any sense of religion because I realised now that I I basically I, I had it already in the kind of core beliefs that as someone 
going to a university in the late 80s, growing up, um, then, then, you know, being in my 20s in London um, in the 90s, I was just kind of absorbing. It was kind of like, um, you know, like you, you, you breathe, p- people were breathing in radiation after Chernobyl. You, you, you don't realise you're doing it, but there it is in the air. You're just breathing it in. I was breathing in all these assumptions about um, liberal values, um, you know, things that I, I didn't even have. I thought they were so kind of self-evidently right and, 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 and true uh, that I didn't even really bother to question them. Um, and I, I was brought to question them ultimately, you know, why do I believe them? Where do, what, what, where do, where do my assumptions about where these things come from? Partly because of um, uh, dwelling on the Romans and how different they were to us, uh, how, how contrary to kind of liberal values, and also uh, thinking about what it was about um, Islam that was different. And then that, that, that question that I said about that, where, where, where the Muslim in the audience said, well, why, you know, you're not questioning your own beliefs in the way that you're questioning my beliefs. And I thought, you know, that was completely right. Um, so basically, um, I think that there's a kind of in- inherent instability within the Western form of Christianity, and perhaps especially within Protestant Christianity, that, that means that atheism is a kind of logical endpoint. And, and humanism and the atheism of the kind that's propagated by, by Richard Dawkins is a kind of godless Protestantism which, of course, a Catholic would say is an oxymoron. (laughs) You summarize those tensions in the book as between the prerogatives of authority and the yearning for reformation, between the letter and the spirit of the law. Describe those those tensions a little more. So uh, basically, I think everything goes back to Paul. Everything always goes back to Paul on this podcast. I mean, I always remember in in church, whenever we had a a reading from Paul, I'd switch off even more than I was already, because it just seemed... (laughs) just sounded gibberish i mean it's kind of i had no idea what they were talking about it sounded, just sounded really dull um and the letters are quite hard i think but i i i think they are by by a kind of quantum degree the most influential um texts that we have from um the the, the period of the roman empire i mean basically they kind of underpin almost everything and the spirit and the letter of the law um they because paul has a problem because he he thinks that um, the crucifixion has in some way delivered a second covenant, um, a, a second covenant between um, God's chosen people and God himself. Um, but Paul is convinced that God's chosen people now includes everyone. So no, there is no Greek or Jew. So the distinctiveness of, of, of his of Jewishness is kind of, dissolved in this but the 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 question then becomes well what is this covenant um you know the the jews have a covenant it's it's written down got given to moses um where is the covenant that um god has agreed with his chosen people uh, um, with christ and paul's answer to this is that the that the covenant is written on on the heart um and he he reaches for a phrase that he, he takes from the Stoics, um, who, who believed that the divine was manifest in the whole of creation, um, and therefore within every human being. And the Stoics called this synodesis. It's, it's the divine spark is in the heart. So we could translate it as conscience. So Paul ba- basically says that the law of God now is written on the heart. It's there within the conscience. So you look inside your heart and you hope that the spirit will illumine your heart and um let you know what is um what 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 is true what 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 the law of god is now of course that that um hardwires in uh an assumption that that you uh, in a christian society you can have law that is of um that the ultimate law can be written down by humans you know looked into their hearts and written it down but it also bakes in, hard bakes in the idea that um, over the course of time, um, 
God's spirit will will illumine people's understanding of what his purposes are more and more. So you have this idea that law can become something that's progressive. Um, but it, you also have the idea that um, over time, that um, that understanding can be occluded by the sinful nature of the fallen world. So you have these kind of tensions. One is that law can be, be progressive, that society can be progressive, that, that we can get closer and closer to an understanding of what God's purposes are, that the spirit will illumine us. Against that, there's the anxiety that as you go through time, so you're going further from the, the, the kind of the founding of the church from the time of Jesus and um, sin is corrupting and uh, tarnishing uh, human society. So that requires a great process of self-cleansing, uh, a process of, of kind of renewal of baptism and washing away of sin. Um, and over the course of Christian history, that's repeatedly been weaponized. And it takes a particular form in um, the Latin half of what has been the Roman Empire. Because what happens there is, is that you, you don't have the kind of the, 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 the empire, the emperor that you, you have in the eastern half in Constantinople. Um, and so the, the people are able in the, in the church are able essentially to kind of construct this model whereby the church itself becomes the agent for cleansing and sanctifying society. And even emperors and kings have to submit themselves to it. So in the 11th century, you have a, a, an emperor, supposedly the heir of um, of, of um of Charlemagne and Constantine and Augustus kneeling in the snow before the Pope. And you have um, the church setting itself up as something that is sovereign, something that um, Christians across uh, Latin Christendom can appeal directly to the Pope oh, and, and the church over the heads of um, earthly kings. And you have this kind of split that is really distinctive to the Latin West, rival ideas of something called the cyclum, the order, Cyclum in Latin means the um, the span of human memory. So it becomes um, th th this idea that, that you have an earthly order, a secular order, and then you have an order that is distinct from that, uh, a religio, the bond that the church is able to, to join humans to the timelessness of um, the, the, the unchanging order of the city of God. So you have this opposition between the city of man and the city of God. Um, and this in the, in the 11th century gets kind of enshrined at, at kind of level of society the sense that there's something that will ultimately be called the secular that there's something ultimately that will be co come to be called religion beds down really strong and this process is kind of a revolutionary process which sees kings being humbled a new model of society being imposed um, warriors who are committed to this new model um, taking it to the limits of the earth in the form of crusades um, entire new um, uh, frameworks of radical intellectuals gathering together in what come to be called universities and um, imposing new understandings of what society should be on people that they condemn as deplorables, as rednecks, as peasants, as people who don't understand uh, what this new reformed um, society should be about. All of these make of medieval Christendom in, in the West over from the 11th century onwards, uh, Europe's first revolutionary society. And it, you have a prototype there for every kind of convulsion that has happened since. So the Protestant Reformation, although it reacts against the Roman church, is nevertheless absolutely part of the same tradition. It's doing exactly the same. It's um, over trying to overthrow a, a, what it sees as a corrupt order, to wash the stain of sin, to wash society clean of the stain of sin, to, um, to set the secular order to one side and establish what religion should clearly be. Um, it, uh, it, it inspires people to, um, to draw arms, to fight, to kill in aid of it. Um, it, it inspires intellectuals to try and impose new order on, um, on first of all, European, European societies, and then in due course, new societies across the Atlantic. Um, and the same thing happens in the Enlightenment, which again, you know, expressed through first the American and then particularly the, the, the French Revolution. Again, you see kings being humbled, you see attempts to um, cleanse a new society, it's to wash it in blood. Um, 
And I think to, to, to a lesser degree, you see it now in, in, in what we're living through at the moment. In a sense, the 60s is a kind of another process of great convulsion, a desire to, to cleanse, to, to reorder. Um, and I think that the, the sense of antagonism that you have very manifestly in, uh, in, in America at the moment um, between uh, people who um, see themselves as entrusted with a great moral responsibility, a charge to cleanse society, to purify it, to set it on new foundations, to wipe away old sins, um, and the impatience that people who by and large are better educated who are products of universities in particular, with people who are not products of universities. Again, that's something that goes back through the centuries, right the way back to the 12th centuries. Um, and I think that, that in that sense, the fascination of it is to realise that, that we are creatures of our historical DNA. We just cannot kind of escape it. And in a sense, the whole of Western civilization, as it's existed since the 11th century, is like San Francisco, built on the San Andreas Fault. It stands there stable for maybe, you know, decades, centuries. And then suddenly there's a great grinding of the tectonic plates and everything comes tumbling down and it has to be rebuilt again. And then the same process happens again. It reminds me a little bit of um, disruption theory in terms of innovations where it's often the, the, it's not necessarily a better idea that gets adopted and takes off. It's like a slightly, it's a more accessible, but uh, oftentimes kind of worse idea, but somehow kind of it's, speaks yeah. to people. <laughs> it's, and it's the accessibility of it that's the key. To, again, to go back to what I was saying before, the, the, this is coded not in philosophy or moral commandments so much as in stories, right. simple stories. Which then does beg the, different, uh, beg the question, then what on earth has happened to the morality of our current times? Well, I think, I, I think that the, um, what's radical about Christianity, and, and it's a kind of, um, it, it's there, obviously, with, with, within the inheritance of the Hebrew scriptures that, that Christians adopt, bundle into, into the Christian Bible, but is the idea that there is strength in weakness, and this is what Nietzsche picks up, about, picks up on Christianity. Uh, Nietzsche is, in a way, I think, penetrates to the heart of what makes Christianity strange and distinctive and influential in a way that, that, that very few Christians do, because he recognises that at the heart of Christianity is a valorization of those who, who are oppressed, those who suffer, those who are slaves. And at the figure of Christ on the cross and the fact that he then emerges triumphant from the dead um, to ascend to heaven, and he suffered the death of a slave. This is the triumph of the slave over the master. This is the triumph of the tortured over the torturer. This is the triumph of the oppressed over the oppressor. And it, 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 it's like a kind of depth charge under every structure of privilege. And it means that the, the privilege can become something that is problematic, mm -hmm. something that, 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 that you hang as, as you know, as something evil, as something that you have to be cleansed of. And it's there again and again through the whole history of Christianity, the rich trying to give up their wealth, to throw it away um, in the French Revolution, to be rich, to be, to be privileged, you know, can, 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 can lead to your death. And now to be privileged is to be unprivileged. To, to have no privilege is to be a source of privilege. Intersectionality to that degree is, is, is just a recalibration of something that's been fundamental to the way that Christians have operated throughout, throughout Christian history. And Nietzsche saw that as a, an intellectual virus. Absolutely. Nietzsche hated it because Nietzsche, um, even though he was kind of short-sighted and, and uh, hypochondriac and wouldn't have lasted a minute in, um, in, ancient, in ancient Athens or Rome, was really into the idea that, you know, that the strong strength was all and that um, the strong, the, 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 um, the beautiful, um, the brave had basically been corrupted, that, that you know, the, the, the blonde beast had, had been tamed and kind of immured in a monastery and had become a kind of a sick, uh, miserable thing, uh, and that this was terrible. Um, 
and that therefore we needed to uh, basically get over this terrible slave morality that Christianity had instilled. Um, what we know that Nietzsche didn't is, is that this would be taken up by the Nazis. And essentially the Nazis did indeed, they, they were the first regime in Western history not just to turn their back on institutional Christianity as the, the, the French revolutionaries did or the Russian revolutionaries, but the, the, core, the core morals, the kind of moral heart of Christianity. And they, they, they repudiated the idea that, um, you know, the slave would triumph over the master. They thought the, mas the master should crush the slave, just as the, the, the Romans had done. And they also reputed the, the idea that there was no Jew or Greek because they thought that absolutely uh, Jews and Greeks were, were racially distinct. Um, and the, the horrors that that unleashed has, has had such a, you know, it's, it's left such a mark that in a sense, and I think that this is one of the reasons why certainly in Europe, institutional Christianity drops off a cliff in the 60s is this kind of dawning realization that, that, that we don't really need institutional Christianity to have that, those Christian values, because rather than ask what would Jesus do, we just have to ask what would Hitler not do. And basically that's, that's the guiding principle in, in every Western society now is what would Hitler not do? Which is why the ultimate insult now isn't to say, you know, Satanist or whatever, it's, it's you're a Nazi. <laughs> It feels like we're in a moment where societally, at least the West and probably and maybe even the world, because the world has bought into the Christian story to a, to a large extent and in the form of in the secularized form of, of human rights. And uh, uh, but um, uh, it feels like we're at a point where even that story is cracking. And is that absolutely? And I'm, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm wondering, is that because is that because more that the inherent tensions of the Christian story that constantly create like it took to to be Leninist for a minute, the contradictions have been heightened, or is it because we are fracturing in because the murring of what Hitler would not do are is not strong enough to keep the story together? Uh, yeah, I think I mean I think that's part. I think you know Nietzsche famously says that without Christian belief, you can't really have Christian values. And, and I think that um, ideas like human rights uh, or, or secularism, you know, they don't just exist. They're, these are essentially theological constructs. They're rooted in Christian theology and history. So if you just say, well, human rights exist, they don't. <laughs> they, they, they don't exist. They have no objective existence whatsoever. So to believe in human rights is just as much a, a leap of faith as to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ rose on the third day and ascended into heaven. It's just that we don't think that anymore. We just, you know, rather like, the, the, and that's the, that was a condition of Christian belief in the Middle Ages. People didn't realize that they were believing. Just like most of us, you know, we don't believe in human rights. We just ex think that they exist. So that's part of it, I think, is, is that... Um, When, 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 when people say, well, why should, you know, why, why, why should I, uh, why should we let refugees in? And liberals turn around and say, well, you know, that, uh, human rights. And people turn around and say, I don't give a stuff about human rights. What are human rights? And liberals say, well, you're a fascist then. And people say, well, say, I don't care. What recourse do liberals have to say, well, actually, you know, you have to let refugees in. If you're a Christian, you can quote the Bible. You can quote, you know, whatever, great inheritance of, of, of Christian charity. But if you, if, if, if you don't, believe, and you can do that because you believe, you believe that this is what God has told you to do, um, that you believe that this is what Jesus commanded. But, but if, you're, if you don't have that, then, then ultimately you, all you can do is kind of say, well, I think that they exist, so you ought to think that they exist. And this is a problem for, 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 Western, for, for liberal society within the West. But I think it's also a growing problem for, um, for Western countries on the global stage, because essentially what the West did, um, and, uh, and anti-slavery was the prototype for this. 
So um, when the British pushed for the abolition of slavery, they, they, they did so, the British government did so because they had a, a massive evangelical movement breathing down their neck. A kind of the first mass protests really in, in, in Western history, forcing a change in government policy. Um, but the British government, when they went to negotiate with the Catholic powers, couldn't justify the abolition of slavery in Protestant terms. So they had to find a kind of, um, a mu you know, a mutually shared language that Catholics and Protestants could share. And then when um, Europeans tried to persuade the Ottomans to abolish slavery, again, they couldn't talk in overtly Christian terms. So they had to try and couch their opposition to slavery in terms that could appeal to um, to kind of the you know the idea that, that, that there's a universal commandment here, um, and the Western powers because they were hegemonic at the time because they had all the military, cultural, economic influence were able to to do this to pass off their very culturally contingent ideas on slavery, on human rights, on the secular as just kind of the way things were, and. In a way, the high watermark of that was the was the United Nations Charter. They were able to present these ideas as though they were so universal that every country in the world had to sign up to them. But what's happened recently is that as Western power retreats, so the kind of culturally contingent nature of those assumptions about human rights, about um, uh, the secular and so on, have come into the to retreat as well. Separation of church and state. Yeah, well, you see that really clearly with events this summer, both in India and in Turkey. So in India, you have um, Modi, the prime minister, laying this foundation stone for a great temple on the site of what hit, uh, radical uh, uh, Hindu, many Hindus think is the birthplace of Rama, the great hero of the Ramayana. Um, and this was a place where a mosque had stood. And lots of Hindus had come to believe that the mosque had been deliberately built on the site of Rama's birth. And so uh, a Hindu mob tore it down in the 90s. And this was a seismic shock to secular opinion in India, which assumed that, that, that India is a secular republic, that this sort of thing couldn't happen. But essentially, the reason India is a secular republic is because um, the British exported the idea of the secular, and it was taken up by Indian English speaking elites and written into the Indian constitution. But now, as, as the hold of those English speaking elites recedes, so you are getting a kind of a, a, a desire on the part of many Hindus in particular to repudiate that as a kind of alien ideology. And, and you know, in a sense, it, it is an alien ideology. It's, 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 it's one that, that would have meant nothing to anyone in India you know, before the British went. Um, and also, you see it in Turkey, where um, President Erdogan reconsecrated um, what had been the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia, built by the Emperor Justinian, um, turned by Ataturk, the, the father of Turkish secularism, in the 30s into a museum. And then this summer got turned by um, Erdogan back into a mosque. So I should, sorry, I, I missed out that, that, that when Constantinople fell to the Turks, the ch cathedral got turned into a mosque. And that's what Erdogan has turned it back into. And again, that is what Erdogan is doing, is repudiating the sectorism of um, the Turkish Republic as something alien, which again, it is. Um, you know, it is. And it, you could almost see um, the s similar tensions in Israel, um, because in a sense, what happened um, to Jews in the, uh, in the 19th century mm -hmm. With the French Revolution was that previously they, the Jews had seen themselves as, as a people, as the people of Israel. And when the French Revolution said, well, you know, as Jews, you, you, you can come out of the ghetto, you can have civic rights, you can become citizens of France. But the quid pro quo was that um, Jewish citizens of France had to identify themselves primarily as French and had to reconstruct what Christians had always called Judaism, but Jews hadn't they had to see themselves as belonging to something called Judaism, which was a religion. And this concept of religion was a kind of, you know, it's a Christian idea. So over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, Jews in Western countries have been encouraged to see themselves as belonging to a religion called Judaism, 
just as since the Second World War, Muslims in the West have been encouraged to think of themselves as belonging to a religion called Islam. But um, with the existence of Israel, there's been scope for for, for Jews to go back to um, a kind of, you know, a pre-French revolutionary understanding of, of their identity. And so also that was the appeal um, for, 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 for kind of alienated, um, unhappy Muslims in the West. That was the appeal of, of, of the caliphate proclaimed by the Islamic State. Um, it, was, it provided an opportunity to kind of go back to, you know, uh, an, an, an understanding that, that, that had existed before the rise of, of Western hegemony in the, in the 18th and 19th century. Um, and I, so I think that, that that is where the world is heading. I think that the, the understanding that, that Western liberals have, which is rooted in, in kind of the inheritance of, of Christian theology and history, that that is retreating. That the more, and the more that happens, so the more things that liberals take for granted, you know, they, will, they we, will be forced to recognise that these are culturally contingent. They're, they're, they're bred of, of the history of the West. I also like to add, as an Israeli, which my accent clearly betrays, that this tension is manifesting on at least two different levels. First, there was the rift that's growing between Israeli Jews and diaspora Jews. They're becoming increasingly incongruent in terms of what defines their identity and their shared values. Diaspora Jews follow the Protestant model, locating their... Jewish identity in the personal belief and choices of the individual, and invertedly in the universality of human experience and humanity and tikkun olam and social justice, whereas Israeli Jews are still see themselves or, or are reverting back to seeing themselves as a people, as a nation. But this battle is also happening in Israel in the, in the conflict between the, the old left that um, is increasingly diminishing, but still holds on to the European Christian version of separation of church and state. And on the other side, a growing voice that wants to see some version of a more theocratic um, national supremacist state. Because for that side, that is what being Jewish means. And the idea of separation of church and state for them is completely foreign and antithetical, just as it is in Modi's India or Erdogan's and, and, Turkey. And, and you said in, you know, when we framed that, you said church and state. And you, you know, the whole point of Israel is that it's Jewish. Um, so, so people will talk about you know synagogue and state or mosque and state, but it never sounds doesn't, doesn't have the same it, the same it, ring. Because that idea of the separation of of the secular from the religious is bred of the history of the church in the medieval West, and I think that that whether it's it's Jews or Muslims or Hindus. In, in, in countries that have been incredibly influenced by Western models. That, and it often, I'm sure it's often subliminal, a sense that, that that way of understanding society as being divided between church and state, as being divided between secular and religion, it is not culturally neutral. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's in a way, it's kind of like a, a, a dust haze, like, like, um, like the English language is for studying the classical world, that it's something that you've got to get rid of to get back to something that perhaps people feel has been lost. What you described as the process you underwent in writing this book, I, I think your book and some of the other uh, works that I've been reading recently have put me through it. I completely took for granted the, uh, despite being a historian, and no, not a historian, a student of history, I, I always took for granted that a secular society is, is a requirement for, for a stable government and state. It never quite sunk in, didn't quite register that this separation, this opposition of church and state is such a recent localized, culturalized fiction. And, yeah, and, well, and without that story, I'm there's sorry. no, you have no substance to, to defer to in defending it. I, like, likewise, I mean, because when I when I wrote uh, in the shadow of the sword, I, I um, 
I described that I said, you know, there are things called Judaism and Islam and Christianity, and they are religions. But I, I don't think that anymore. I, you know, there's certainly something called Christianity because that is a word that, that goes back to the second century AD. And there are Christians who construct something called um, Judaism to, to serve as a kind of counter to Christianity. And they construct something, you know, by the sixth century called paganism. But these are these are identities that get put onto Jews and onto people, you know, who, who worship the gods or whatever. Um, and I, I now realise that that to describe, you know, to talk about there being a religion called Judaism in the context of, um, say, fifth century AD, is is it's not just to Christianise it. In a sense, it's to Protestantise it. And th- and this is exactly the the problem with writing about, you know, basically pre modern history is that. These are the trick, you know, these are the elephant traps that are waiting for you everywhere you go. And if you start writing about Judaism in the Middle Ages, it's, it's, it's kind of as anachronistic as saying that Julius Caesar conquered France. It's kind of right, but it's also not right. And that's, that's really why I wrote Dominion was as much for myself as for any, you know, because I wanted to, to, to work, I wanted to kind of stress test all these words that I've been using and say, well, where did they originate from? Where do they come from? Where is it acceptable to use it? Um, so it was, you know, it was a kind of challenge to write a, a history of Christianity that doesn't use the word religion until I get to the 18th century. But I think that, that that's right. I don't think that you should use words that carry a signification that are anachronistic when used in certain periods. Even today, it's it's the, I think this is a great line to draw again, from my direct experience of Judaism, growing up in Jerusalem, you see something that is definitely not, does not answer to the definition of religion as, as you put it, because it is, it is much more statist. It is, it is inherently legalistic. It believes in, in general, in enforcing certain rules and behaviors on society and doesn't give a damn about what you believe in your heart of hearts. Uh, right, which is Protestant. Thing, ex- exactly. And, and then if you travel across the ocean and you meet American Jews and you see something completely different and their understanding of what it means to be Jew, how you celebrate it, how you express it is contradictory. And not only contradictory, they view the each side views um, the other as violating the heart of Judaism. And, and, and that is because the American version is and i think a lot of the diaspora is like you said it's a it's protestantism it's protestantism with a jewish face i I think reform reform judaism is is kind of very self-consciously protestant i mean it's 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 an attempt you know to 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 construct a model of something called judaism that can kind of take its place alongside um the you know lutheranism or whatever and i think that that essentially um liberalism is is Again, you know, it's it, it, it's it's atheist Protestantism, and there's a sense in which you know the Protestant churches in um, certainly in Europe, um, and 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 I think in in America too, apart from the Pentecostalists, are, are kind of in decline. But I think that's only seemingly so because I think actually, in a way, Protestantism has dissolved itself so completely that it's now just become the air that people breathe in. It's become the waters that people swim in. The because because of the essence the essence of, of, of Protestantism is exactly this idea of enlightenment that the spirit illumines you have a kind of you know a direct link you have your personal beliefs that um, you have your personal religio your personal bond with God and you know that things are right because you know that they're right ultimately. And, and that progress is possible and is a good thing. The, absolutely. So those are all those are all kind of fu- fundamentals to it. Um, so you know, if you you, you ask a liberal, um, well, why do you think this? The, the odds are they say, well, I just know it's right, and they know it's right because that you know they're heirs to the the Protestant tradition that tells you that you look into your heart to know what is right, and, and you feel yourself justified. And if you feel yourself justified, then you know that, 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 that you're right. You know, it's, it's the operation of grace. So I think that, that um, liberals, and again, I kind of speak for myself here, are, are people who feel sanctified by a kind of secular experience of grace. Mm-hmm. They feel that they, their hearts have been opened to the truth. But, 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 you know, this is a theological, fantastical idea. 
I mean, I'm listening to you both and it sounds like you've kind of gone through this process of uh, <laughs> your own kind of revelation in terms of understanding the way that the way that we think has been constructed around a Christian framework. But I, I kind of want to go back to my earlier question because I, where does it leave us, right? Where, where does it, now that the, you know, the haze has been somewhat lifted and you're starting to, we're starting to evaluate our present with a better understanding of the past, then what? And I think like as an individual, it sounds like there's a, there's a sense of uh, awakening, I suppose, just, just the way that you guys are talking about it, but on a societal level, I don't, where does it, where does it leave us? I don't know. <laughs> and I don't, I don't feel any great responsibility to tell if I do because I, I've, I've basically, I've only written it because I think it's interesting. <laughs> I, I, that's, that's basically why I've done it, is I just think it's so interesting for its own sake. Uh, it's, it's not that I'm offering this as, uh, you know, that it will change society or anything. Or, or I, just, I just think it's really, really interesting. Um, I mean, what I suppose I would say is that I think that it um, it's it kind of makes me feel <sighs> that I can't really take anything for granted. I guess I, I, I guess I'm a liberal who's lost his faith. Um, I don't really believe it anymore. I, I, if I hold to kind of liberal principles it's it's in the way that a catholic who's lost his faith still you know goes to church and does the the rituals um i I, so i'm I'm kind of looking around for some solid foundation on which to rest my my gut instincts you know but but so i think i think it is quite a corrosive process in that sense um i i mean i where will society go? I think. I mean, I think that that in Europe and and in America, I, I guess there are three routes. One is that um, liberalism has become self sustaining. So Nietzsche was wrong. You you don't need Christianity to to fuel it. It just people will just you know it's it's, it's so self evidently right that that it will just propagate itself. Um, so. You know, Christ- Christianity was like the the kind of the body of the rocket that got you through the atmosphere, and now you can jettison it and float through space and time with, without that, without the boosters. Um, the, o- the the other possibility is that Nietzsche was right, and that, that without Christian belief, Christian values will atrophy, and, um, and you will get uh, an increasing. Uh, insistence on the part of people that they don't owe anything to the weak or the poor and that they don't, um, that the idea of a kind of universal humanity is junk, that, uh, you know, America first or, um, you know, let's pull up the drawbridge or whatever. Um, And perhaps, you know, looking at various Western countries, that might shade into a kind of soft form of fascism perhaps. Um, I mean, you know, we've all been pretty inoculated, but um, fascism was very attractive to people. That's the, the kind of terrible truth. People like uh, strength and power and glamour and swagger and flags and dinosaurs. Yeah, people like dinosaurs exactly. Um, and the third possibility, I suppose, is that um, people might think, "Wow, oh, shit, we better cling to Christianity." <laughs> You know, even if it's a kind of quite soft form of Christianity. Um, so I don't know what, which of those will happen. Um, but I, I, I can't really see any other, you know, those are the three roads that, that I think Western societies are likely to take. I mean, the much more interesting question is what will happen in, in the rest of the world. And I think there we can see that, it, that, that it's a process of returning to their own civilizational roots. And that's true um, of the Muslim world, it's true of uh, India, it's true of China. Uh, and so that's what makes me think that perhaps um, the, the West as well will do that, that it will return to um, a sense of its own civilizational roots, the less global it feels that it is. Because at the moment, the West still thinks that its values are universal. It still thinks that it's the, the way the West sees the world is the way the world is. And I think the more 
that we inhabit a multipolar civilizational world where other ways of seeing what humanity are about come to have their own heft. So the more the West will come to recognise that its own values are are not universal. And I, I think that that will kind of foster a sense, well, we are what we are. In our interconnectivity the made it, I think to some extent, deflated the the ability to to believe in a common story because because it stretched it too thin but isn't it also a challenge um for for societies who are trying to regress uh to their to their more internal um language um of thought just because things are still uh, the visibility of of everything that happens around the world and uh and the commentary of everything that happens around the world happens on a global scale unless you, you know, create your own internet like Russia and China does? I, I don't think that, I don't think that, um, that, that, that Modi particularly cares. I don't think Erdogan cares. I don't think that uh, Xi cares. I, I, I really don't think they care what the West thinks anymore. And I don't think that they care, you know, I don't, you know in India or Turkey, I don't think that um, the ruling parties care what the, 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 the kind of secular traditional elites think. I mean, it may be that that they go too far and the secular elites fight back, but um, it doesn't seem to be happening. And in China, I mean, you know, in China, they are, you know, we say never again. In China, they are locking up a million people in concentration camps, sterilizing them, making, you know, f- making them work as slaves. And do, do we care? We don't care at all. You know, everybody's talking about slavery, but the slavery that we're talking about is the slave, you know, the, the, the inherited sins of our civilization. We care about ourselves. We care about our morality. We care about our souls. We care about our, our inheritance of sin. We don't care what the Chinese do, really. We don't care about the Uyghurs. So you, universalism basically reached its peak in the, in the 60s, 70s, and, then, and now it's just receding? I think, I mean, I think it had one kind of final... Indian summer, as it were, <laughs> maybe not the right phrase, but in, in the 90s, where people really did think history had ended. And, you know, of, 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 of Fukuyama and Huntington, I think Huntington was, was, has turned out to be much more of a prophet. I think he's right. I think uh, we are moving into a, a world of, of, of multiple civilizations. And I think that um, COVID and the fragmentation that that's imposed will will only um, expedite that process. Do you have any other hunches on where things are going? And it, it's not not as an expert in in future telling, um, but just this is I think where we're where we're coming from. Although of a reader uh, a reader of and lover perhaps of sci fi and fantasy, there could be some <laughs> some hints there as well. No. Um, but, but what I will say is that one of the things that struck me when I was writing about um, the collapse of, of, of the Roman Empire and, and the coming of Islam was the way in which um, the, the, the collapse of Roman power was such a protracted and seismic event that it generated myths that still haunt us, of, of which the most potent is obviously Islam. But if you look at the opposite end of the Roman Empire in Britain, um, there's a very similar myth. I mean, it's which is the story of Arthur, um, a, you know, an order of, of people committed to defending the truth, who who have their kind of moment in the sun and then then fade, but will come again. But but those stories continued to resonate through modern fantasy and and and, and science fiction. So the, the the coming of Islam and the collapse of Rome. Is there in Dune um, the, um, the, the 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 collapse of the Roman Empire and the establishment of, of kingdoms on the ruins? Is there in Lord of the Rings? So both science fiction and fant- and and and, and it, the collapse of the Roman Empire is there in, in Asimov's Foundation. So all these foundational texts of science fiction and fantasy are, are are kind of drawing on this this seismic event that happened centuries and centuries and centuries ago, and I think that the the collapse, if it's, you know, indeed the collapse, let's say the retreat 
of Western power will have a similarly seismic impact. I think it will, the very process of, of, of the, the, the retreat of Western power will in a way ironically embed it because it will generate myths and uh, tropes and ways of seeing the world that will um, endure for God knows how long. And the fact that the West control, basically has invented the internet and control, you know, it, it has Hollywood, it has it's TV, it's entertainment is, is still as influential as it is, means that, 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 that they will continue, the soft power will continue to endure even if the hard power perhaps isn't what it was. So last question, and that's the theme of the, I think of that, that motivated us to create the blog. I think it's the sense of a loss of shared meaning or even a personal direction, this kind of floating in, in empty space feeling that, mm-hmm. that I think a lot of us uh, are, are, are having right now. How, how do you um, start to fill up the, that, that void? Um, I, I, I personally found the process of, um, studying, uh, all these Christian texts over the course of 2000 years, I found it a, a, actually a very moving and humbling experience because I realized that so much that I dismissed as, as, um, kind of retrograde superstition actually were, was the expression of people who were wrestling with issues that I also wrestle with, because in a way they were creating the cultural context in which I exist. Um, so the, the, the effect of that lingers with me as, as something perhaps more than just um, food for historical study, because I think that um, in a way, although I, I, I don't believe in a supernatural dimension. I think that that if I'm going to believe in, if I'm going to try and believe in a supernatural dimension, I have to believe in the uh, the, the the cultural tradition of the supernatural that I've been raised in and that I am heir to. So, um, to that extent, I'm experimenting with um, trying to 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 see the world through non-modern eyes. Um, not, not arriving at a, po- a, a point of kind of coherent um, belief in a given framework of the supernatural, but kind of experimenting and, and thinking, well, what would it be like to see the world through the eyes of a um, Protestant divine in the 17th century or um, uh, 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 a mystic in the 14th century or um, uh, a monk in the 5th century? And just to imagine, well, what if it, what if it were real? And I find the experience of doing that actually incredibly powerful and and and, and humbling, because it, it it makes me appreciate that in a way, my lack of belief is just a belief as well, and perhaps not as interesting a belief. I mean, I actually really think that. I really think that my lack of belief is incredibly dull. I think atheism is really dull compared to belief in a world where there are angels and. Um, you know, angels with trumpets. And it's so much more fun. Tom Holland, thank you, thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you so much. You really appreciated it. I'm really sorry I've got to rush off to supper, okay. but thank you for having me. Lovely to talk to you. And um, no, I'm sorry and thank you for tolerating my 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 fan, fanboy. I even realized that in my excitement, I, I referred to uh, Richard Dawkins as Charles Dawkins. Obviously, thinking about uh, Darwin um, because obviously they are the same. <laughs> He'd be thrilled by that. That's a kind of James Joyce uh, crossover. He'd, be, but, he'd really <laughs> love that. <laughs> Uh, it was thrilling to talk to you, uh, but I just got, I got to mention that I had the honor in the past five years to produce a variety of interviews with a variety of individuals, presidential candidates included, and none have left me so uh, discombobulated in excitement as interviewing you. <laughs> well, I'm very honored and well, I'm thrilled to hear that and, and really touched. Thanks so much. I've, you know, you made, you've made my weekend. Thank you, Tom. Lovely to talk to you both. You can follow Tom on Twitter at Holland underscore Tom, and you should definitely buy his books. Thank you for listening to Uncertain Things. You can find us on uncertain.substack.com. Please like, share, subscribe, 
we have great guests coming up talking about the end of the world and politics. So until then, stay sane.